By the end of this video, you're going to know everything you need to know about 10 of Warhammer 40k's darkest characters. And let me tell you, this list was not easy to put together, as 40k is a franchise that is well renowned for its sheer level of brutality, and on occasion, elements, stories, and characters that are so unnecessarily dark that they become just a, just a tad bit ridiculous. But you know, like in a fun way. We're going to be taking a look at a predatory alien creature that snatches its victims from the shadows and then learns all of their secrets by devouring their brain. A Primarch that is so ridiculously evil that pretty much everything that's gone wrong in the franchise can at least in some way trace its origins back to him. And not to mention several different mad scientists that each like to expose their victims to all manner of horrifying experiments. At the end of the day, whether or not somebody finds something dark, disturbing, or scary is all subjective, so this is my personal list. And in order to keep it interesting, I tried to vary up the factions that I talk about. Because otherwise, if I'm being honest, this would have just been a list of the top 10 most messed up dark Eldar characters. Anyways, quick shout out to this video's sponsor, and then we're gonna dive headfirst into the grim dark. You might not know this, but the most time consuming thing when it comes to making lore videos is doing an absolutely metric ton of research. And when I say a ton of research, I mean a ton. During the day, I mostly stick to PDFs and physical books. But at night, I turn into a super efficient multitasker by listening to a ton of audiobooks with my Raycon earbuds. That way, no matter what I'm doing, whether it's working out, doing chores, cooking, whatever, I can still be learning about my favorite fictional universes. Fun fact, I fall asleep every single night using my Raycons to listen to some good old fashioned grimdark stories. Which honestly, now that I think about it, kind of explains a lot. Getting good quality earbuds is not something that should be prohibitively expensive. You know, like other things that myself and people who watch this channel may or may not be obsessed with. Which is why I love Raycon so much. Not only are you getting some top tier earbuds with fantastic audio quality, but you're getting them at the most competitive prices out there, as they start at half the price of other premium audio brands and sound just as good. With Raycon, you get premium sounding audio quality without breaking the bank. Whether you're looking for a pair of everyday earbuds, low latency gaming headphones, or a speaker with a battery that will last all night, Raycon's got you covered. They have a 32 hour battery life and offer eight hours of continuous playtime. They have everything you could possibly want in a pair of premium earbuds, and customizable sound profiles, crystal clear call quality, and they're even water and sweat resistant. Raycon even offers easy and free returns with every purchase, so you can feel confident in your decision to buy a set of these amazing earbuds. I'm confident you'll love them as much as I do. Ready to buy something small with a big impact? Then click on the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash Westhammer to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Big thanks to Raycon for sponsoring this video. Number 10. Tiberius the Red Wake Although Tiberius fights for the Imperium, all those who have witnessed him in battle will attest he is a frighteningly terrifying monster. He is the Red Wake, the Shade Lord, and the Chapter Master of the Carcharodons, a chapter that was already known for its particularly brutal style of warfare. As a nomadic fleet-based chapter with no homeworld, they prowl the void like a pack of hungry sharks, drawn to the most brutal of war zones by the scent of fresh blood. No call for reinforcements is ever issued, no requests from other chapters, and yet they appear where they are needed, to carve a gore-soaked path through all those that would threaten the Imperium of Mankind. They tend to favor jagged, serrated, or chain weaponry that will inflict as much visceral damage as possible, tearing through enemy ranks in a shower of gore, eviscerating all that would stand in their way. The Red Wake is no exception to this, and perhaps exemplifies the Krakardon's savage tactics better than any of his brothers. Tiberius is a giant, even amongst other Astartes, towering over his brothers in a heavily augmented suit of tactical dreadnought armor. Now, despite his enormous size, the Red Wake is said to move so quickly in battle, it's nearly impossible to track him with the naked eye. He is a blur of flensing claws and unrestrained butchery. He is a blood-drenched killing machine that cleaves his way through the enemy ranks, leaving mountains of shredded and mangled corpses in his wake. On both of his hands is an artificer power gauntlet, each of which is equipped with an oversized retractable lightning claw. The claws are named Hunger and Slake, and have been stained red with the blood of countless enemies. The hunger for the blood of the enemies of the Emperor, and the slaking in the spilling of it. Not many have seen the naked face of the Red Wake, but to those who have, they say it is a visage of pure terror. The face of death itself. It is a pale, jagged nightmare of deep scars and exposed bones, with jagged teeth that hunger for prey. 
If that wasn't disturbing enough for an Imperial Astartes, there are even rumors circulating that the pair of lightning claws he wields are the very same one that were owned by the Primarch of the Night Lords, Conrad Kurz. Though as of right now, those whispers remain just rumors. Number nine, Lorgar. On a bit more of a personal note, the thing I find most horrifying when I'm reading, watching, or playing any form of scary media is the concept of fanaticism. It's kind of terrifying when you think about it. The fact that someone can have complete and profound belief that what they are doing is right, no matter how horrific their actions are or how much pain they inflict on others, while simultaneously lacking the ability to be reasoned with on any level. A fanatic is a person who can't change their mind and can't change the subject. In my opinion, fanatics are far scarier than any ghost, ghoul, or Dracula. Sure, a single fanatic is scary enough, but if left unchecked or given a position of power, that individual can become a demagogue. Through their charismatic words, the individual becomes a group, which in turn becomes a mob, and then eventually into a full-blown cult. An army of deranged lunatics, ready to burn down everything you've ever loved in the name of some utterly alien cause. Reason, logic, empathy, and understanding, all these things are sacrificed on the proverbial altar in exchange for an echo chamber, where the fanatics' own twisted ideals echo back and forth through their ranks, growing louder and more deranged with each subsequent echo. The fanatics will then propel themselves further down a dark path of bloodshed and murder as they become more and more radicalized. Whether the cult be based in hedonistic and debased orgies of excess or self-righteous puritanical tyranny, it ultimately doesn't matter what form the fanaticism takes, as the damage such individuals can inflict is without limits. It doesn't matter how charismatic, righteous, intelligent, or kind you are. There is no reasoning with the mob, no debating the cult. You're either a believer or a heretic, and all heretics must be purged. It's probably why to this day that one scene in The Mist, where the one nutjob radicalizes all of the survivors trapped in the grocery store and convinces them to sacrifice one of their friends to the eldritch horrors lurking outside, it ranks as one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen in a horror movie in a long time. And it's also why the word bearers, and more specifically, their Primarch Lorgar, are so deeply horrifying to me. I'll eventually get around to doing a deep dive on him, but for the moment, as a brief introduction to the character, Lorgar is the Primarch of the Space Marine Legions known as the Wordbearers. He was a deeply religious person, raised by the priest Corferon on his homeworld of Colchis. By the time he would come to take his place with the Emperor's Imperium and lead the Wordbearers in the Great Crusade, he had fully dedicated himself to worshipping the Emperor as the one true god, something that completely went against everything that the Emperor stood for. Now, despite this, for unknown reasons, the Emperor allowed this to continue for a time, until the Word Bearers began to fall behind in their tally of conquered worlds. You see, a portion of the Word Bearers would choose to stay behind on each of the worlds they came to, molding the population until they had completely dedicated themselves to the worship of the Emperor. Now, this obviously left many of the worlds they visited to be some of the most fiercely loyal that had been recaptured in the Great Crusade, but their efficiency overall had certainly fallen behind. The Emperor decided that he had had enough and chastised Lorgar and the Wardbearers by bombing Lorgar's prized city of Monarchia, a city that had become the epicenter of Emperor worship. The physical and symbolic act of the god figure smiting all those that worshipped him was not lost on Lorgar. Although he swore to cease worship, the need for a god was too deeply ingrained in him, and he would set off on a pilgrimage to find beings truly worthy of his devotion. He would inevitably find the Chaos Gods. Now, this was the beginning of the Horus Heresy, as chaos and corruption were allowed to spread and fester throughout the Word Bearers, and then eventually through the other legions as well. When the Heresy was in full swing, Lorgar was a deeply disturbed individual. All of the grisly and horrifying acts of genocide him and his legion committed were ultimately justified by the ruinous powers, as they were the primordial truth of the universe. Every murder, every betrayal, every act of sustained blasphemy, was viewed by the mad Primarch as noble and righteous. And to me, that utter conviction, the supreme unshakable belief in what you are doing is correct, despite the grotesque aftermath left in the wake of every action you take. That someone could be so depraved as to decorate their flagship with the crucified bodies of sacrificial citizens, or view the murder of an entire world as righteous, an act to be celebrated. The idea that somebody could be so utterly insane, yet do all of this with a smile on their face, plagued by delusions of grandeur and enraptured by holy fervor, 
is unbelievably terrifying to me. It is one of 40K's deepest ironies that it was Lorgar who penned the Lectitio Divinitatis, the holy book that proclaimed the emperor as the one true god of humanity, a book that in the 42nd millennium is venerated by the imperial cult and set the foundations for the imperial creed. This is a passage from the novel Betrayer, where Lorgar was trying to get Magnus of the Thousand Sons to understand and appreciate what he was trying to do, and ultimately get Magnus to dedicate himself fully to the heresy. For reference, this conversation happens right after the events on Kalth, one of the Ultramarines worlds that the word bearers would invade and slaughter millions of people. The way he speaks of the warp gives me chills every time I read it. He speaks in equal parts fascination and terror. Kalth is the syncopated backbeat to the song, the rhythm beneath the rhyme. That much fire, that much misery, that much pain. The suffering has always fueled the warp in random stains and stigmata. And now we learn the virtue of control. Can you hear it? Can you hear the pain stirring the tides? Can you hear the crash of those waves, Magnus? Can you hear how those black tides beat a million hearts bursting out loud? As rhythmic as drums in the deep cold. The tide of the Sea of Souls can be altered by mortal hands, brother. Listen. Listen. We're reordering the warp itself, Magnus, changing it through pain. We're rewriting the song. There, a ship burns in Latona's atmosphere, the cries of the doomed souls echoing into the Empyrean. And there, a warship plows into the surface of Ulixis, digging its own grave, taking a hundred thousand souls shrieking into the afterlife. Do you hear them dying, Magnus? Do you hear the song shifting in time to their extinguished essences? Every life, every death, every cry of pain across these burning worlds thins the veil between reality in the first realm. Call it Hades or Hell, Jahannam, Naraka, the underworld. Call it the warp. Call it whatever you will. But I am bringing it forth onto the material plane. Kalth was the genesis of the storm, Magnus. I will make an entire subsector suffer enough that the curtain falls and the 500 worlds drown in the warp. Tell me you can feel it. Tell me you can hear the million, million demons shrieking and baying, desperate to be born upon these burning worlds. Whether or not you're a fan of Lorgar's character comes down to personal taste, but there's no denying that his super dark conviction is definitely creepy. Number eight, the Lictor. Despite the fact that you've probably seen a lot of different Lictors throughout the lore, and if you're a Tyranid player, you've probably fielded several of them at once in the 40k tabletop game. It's important to remember that all Tyranids are the same organism. Every Lictor that has ever lived is THE Lictor, each one containing the memories, experience, and evolutionary advantage of every Lictor body that had come before. The Lictor is the apex of evolution, a perfect killing machine honed over countless millennia. They act as scouts for the Tyranid Swarm, moving ahead of the Hive Fleet's advance and gathering crucial intel. They locate pockets of resistance and determine any and all weak points within an enemy's structures. They are solitary predators that prefer to hunt from the shadows, picking off key targets one by one, leaving the survivors with an overwhelming feeling of dread, knowing they are completely helpless against the unseen enemy. Its seemingly random and utterly lethal attack patterns sow dismay and terror throughout the ranks of its enemies, in some extreme examples leading to a complete breakdown of the enemy's morale and command structures, as the prey begins to accept the inevitability that it is only a matter of time before the Lictor comes for them. This has given the Lictor a particularly fearsome reputation amongst members of the Guard. They are remarkably patient hunters that can maintain perfectly still and undetected for days, weeks, or even months on end, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike. When that time comes, they are horrendously efficient and are equipped with an entire arsenal of bioweaponry used to quickly eliminate and dismember their targets as quickly and quietly as possible. For example, the feeder tendrils that hang from a lictor's mouth are strong enough to penetrate their prey's eyes, drilling directly into the brain cavity and then being used to quickly devour its brain while it's still alive. Through the consumption of its prey's brain tissue, it is able to learn everything the individual knew in life, key command posts, military secrets, and any and all information that would be beneficial to the hive's attack. 
This is a passage from the Devastation of Baal that follows a lictor that has moved behind enemy lines and is scouting out the Blood Angel's defenses for the incoming Hive Fleet. The lictor looked like a creature onto itself. It moved as a solitary organism. It had operated on its own for years, far away from the Hive Fleet, but it was not apart from the Hive Mind. That was the mistake the prey always made. Even at this corpuscular level, it was a mistake to see the lictor as a lictor. One of millions. There were not many. There was one. The lictor was the lictor. Every iteration was a copy, better than perfect for eons of improvement, party to the actions, mistakes, and successes of every other lictor that had come before. Welded to the very genes of its being were untold millions of years of experience. It was on ball just as it was simultaneously on a thousand other worlds throughout the galaxy. It put ancient lessons into action. Sight was the easiest sense to fool. The lictor moved at night when it was harder to see. Chromatic microscales lent it near-perfect chameleonic ability, even in the full light of day. Deformable organ clusters embedded in its skin allowed it to change its shape somewhat, enabling it to take on the rough texture of stone or mimic fronds of vegetation. Smell was a more primal sense, harder to deceive because of it. The lictor managed that too. It had virtually no scent. Only when it flooded the air with pheromone trails to guide its kin beasts did its emissions become noticeable. By then, it was too late. And most prey could hear, so it made no sound when it moved. Special arrangements of hair baffled the whispers of its limbs moving over one another, and more esoteric senses were equally well accounted for. Its electromagnetic profile was minimal. Its brain case was shielded by eternal bone structures against energy leakage. The nerves in its body were similarly cloaked. Its hooves were shaped to make the minimum of vibration. And although it could not entirely stop the perturbation of the air made by its movements, its chitinous plates were fluted in precise molecular fractal patterns to minimize its wake. It gave off no heat. It shed no cells unless damaged. Its psychic link with the hive mind was like spider silk, gossamer thin, strong, and almost impossible to detect. More adaptations heaped on top of more. Unlike a natural organism who loses certain gifts in favor of others as evolution pushes it down a particular path, the lictor's advantages were retained. New gifts stacked atop the others. Its genetic structure was incredibly complex. Within every cell was billions of years worth of adaptation, culled from every lictor, coiled up one over the other. Anything useful to its role, and no matter how inconsequentially seeming, it retained forever. Every machine and psychic ability the Imperium had geared towards its detection, the lictor could evade. The hive mind had consumed far more advanced races than mankind. Infiltrating Ball was child's play. There was no need for it to employ a fraction of its considerable talents. Number 7. The Nightbringer Considering that I just recently talked about the Catan in my last video, I'm going to keep this entry short, but the Nightbringer definitely deserved to be on this list. He was said to be the most physically powerful of all the Gatan, godlike beings that devoured entire stars before eventually making contact with the Necron Tyr and forming an alliance with them against the Old Ones during an event known as the War in Heaven. The Gatan were originally formless entities, but the Necron Tyr crafted them frames of living metal with which to inhabit. Each of these living metal bodies was said to represent the essence of each Gatan. The Nightbringers sported a Grim Reaper motif, which is quite fitting as the Nightbringer is figuratively and somewhat literally the embodiment of death itself. He was said to be the one that introduced the emotion of fear to the physical universe. This creature would prey upon entire systems, taking a sick and twisted delight in the suffering he would inflict on untold billions, gorging himself on the terror of his victims. During the time in which the Necron Tyr worshipped the Catan as gods, the Nightbringer was seen as the god of death, an entity whose hunger for the souls of mortals was never satiated. Now, in the 42nd millennium, the Catan exist as a shattered species, each of the remaining ones having been broken into dozens of shards. Each of these shards contains a splinter of the original Catan's power and are said to be some of the most dangerous weapons the Necrons have access to. The Nightbringers are said to be the most difficult to control. Those who witness the towering form of the Nightbringer find themselves frozen with fear as the icy fingers of death wrap around their mind, making them easy prey for his cold and calculated reaping. Number 6. Goj Van Dyer Unlike the other entries on this list, Van Dyer himself is not really much of a threat physically. 
He's an old man that through a huge campaign of coordinated assassinations, backstabbing, and blackmailing, managed to become the head of not just the administratum, but also the ecclesiarchy. At the time, making him single-handedly the most powerful person in the entire Imperium, and next to the Emperor himself. I actually had a pretty lengthy segment on his entire backstory in my Sisters of Battle deep dive if you're interested. What makes him creepy is his utter insanity. The dude was a vindictive monster, who in his later years was known to babble gibberish to himself at all times. Now, any who witnessed such a display were told that the Emperor was directly conversing with him. Or more commonly, Vandire would just have them executed. At one point, he would discover a faction of warrior women known as the Daughters of the Emperor, who would one day become the Sisters of Battle. He deceived them into thinking he was the Chosen of the Emperor. The creepy bastard renamed them the Brides of the Emperor, conscripting them into service as his personal bodyguards. The lore doesn't go into a lot of specifics here, but it's not difficult for us to imagine this power-obsessed monster had taken this proud and honorable faction and degraded them into a harem of eye candy to be at his side at all times. His period of rule would come to be known as the Reign of Blood. No one was safe from his tyranny, and as his insanity and paranoia grew with every passing day, he would take to torturing any of those who opposed him, regardless of whether or not they were guilty. He would claim that through the sadistic acts he inflicted on others, he was purifying their souls. He had a massive network of spies and other militaristic factions that had pledged loyalty to him. Whether it was because of belief in his cause or out of fear of what he would do if they refused his orders, most likely varies from person to person. That fear would have been well-founded, however, as he would unleash his armies against countless worlds within the Imperium, if he detected even a small percentage of a planet not being completely under his control. Whether that take the form of virus bombing innocent worlds, to melting a planet's polar ice caps in order to drown its entire population, there was no limit to the profound levels of cruelty the mad Ecclesiarch wouldn't condemn entire populations to. Due to his madness and paranoia, it is believed that many of these worlds were actually completely loyal, and that the bloodshed that would follow slaked nothing more than his ego. Thankfully, Vandire's rule would eventually come to an end, when many of the other Imperial forces rose up against him, including the Custodians, who at the time had retreated into the Imperial Palace. Their role was to answer only to the Emperor, so they had mostly stayed neutral in the affairs of the Imperium. It was through a conversation with one of these custodians that Alicia Dominica, a woman that would become the first saint of the Adeptus Sororitas sometime later, and the founder of the Ebon Chalice Convent, would be convinced to journey to the Golden Throne, where it is believed that the Emperor spoke directly to her and told her the truth of Vandire's madness. She returned to the palace immediately and executed him on the spot for crimes against the Imperium. Despite his relatively short rule, there are still echoes of Vandire's reign of blood that continue to haunt the Imperium even today, thousands of years later. And he remains one of 40K's creepiest characters. Number 5. Illuminar Ceres The Necron dynasties can't agree on much, but one thing they seem to all be in alignment on is that Illuminar Ceres is a completely despicable monster. It was he that was responsible for the Necron's ascendancy into their living metal forms through biotransference. The genesis of their transformation may have started in the Catan's knowledge, but it was Ceres who built the machinery to make it happen. He has little remorse for this event and sees it simply as another stepping stone to his ultimate journey of unlocking the secrets to life and eventually ascending to godhood. Despite his nature as something of a pariah amongst other Necrons, they still all recognize his sheer unequivocal genius, and thus no Pharon would be foolish enough to deny his support. As a being of living metal, Ceres is no longer hindered by sleep or the need to stop and deal with the countless frailties and needs of those who still inhabit bodies of flesh. Thus, there is nothing to distract him from his purpose. He is a creature with thousands of years of experience delving into the secrets of life Yet, despite his relentless pursuit of knowledge, the secrets of the soul always seem just beyond his grasp. Some believe such forbidden knowledge was only ever meant to be known by the gods, a belief that Ceres refuses to accept. To the end of unlocking the secrets of the universe, Ceres has descended into a calculated madness of dissection, torture, and all manner of other horrors in which he inflicts on his captive test subjects. Whereas creatures like the Drukhari delight and feed off the pain they inflict on others, Ceres is seemingly immune to it, finding the act of torture nothing less than fascinating and ultimately enlightening. 
He is a mad scientist, an individual driven down a depraved path in the ultimate quest for knowledge that sees no act as too taboo, malicious, or cruel. He is the incarnation of science taken to its extremes, unbound by the shackles of morality. Because of his complete understanding of organic life forms and the exact methods with which to deal the most damage and maximize their levels of pain and suffering, he is completely unrivaled when it comes to upgrading and augmenting every weapon, construct, and facet of Necron machinery. Even for a race as terrifying as the Necrons, his methods are seen by his peers as needlessly cruel. Yet, as will become a pattern with Ceres, begrudgingly accepted as a necessary evil. He accepts payment for his services in the form of captive slaves from all of the other mortal races, taking a particular delight in Eldari test subjects due to their ability to perceive sensations on levels far greater than any other race. Those captured by him will be taken to the laboratory catacombs of the tomb world of Xantragora, where they will spend the rest of their days in pain-filled agony, ancient stasis machinery keeping the subjects alive and fully aware through the horrific procedures he conducts upon them. He feels no pity, no remorse, or any form of kinship with such inferior life forms, and thus gives them nothing to numb or dull the pain. Such an act of mercy would be a waste of resources, and would add complications to achieving his desired test results. He finds the screams of his victims ultimately annoying, and thus in lieu of the aforementioned pain-reducing medication, he finds it more efficient to simply shut off his audio receptors, as his array of monomolecular tools tear apart his victims, molecule by agonizing molecule. Number 4. Typhus Originally known as Typhon, Typhus, first captain of the Death Guard and herald of Nurgle, is potentially the most feared of all the Death Guard commanders and is most favored by Nurgle, seconded only to his Primarch father Mortarion. He would over time rise within the ranks of the Death Guard and eventually become the first captain. Although he had latent psychic abilities, he would keep these hidden from the Legion, as the Death Guard and Mortarion had no fondness for witches. During the Horus Heresy, he would find himself being pushed further down the path towards chaos, and eventually into the arms of Grandfather Nurgle. He would end up betraying his Legion during their flight to the invasion of Terra. He did this by unleashing one of Nurgle's gifts, the Destroyer Plague, a horrific disease that caused the Death Guard to rot and mutate, inflicting profound levels of agony. Yet due to their superhuman levels of resistance to poison and disease, they could not die. It was only through Mortarion eventually giving himself and the Legion over to the service of the Plague Lord that the Legion would be spared. They may have survived, but whether or not they had been saved is up for debate, as this was the event that turned the Death Guard into the Plague Marines. Typhus then absorbed the entirety of the malignant power of the Destroyer Plague into his body. The act of taking the disease within himself swelled his body to ridiculous proportions and fused his armor shut. He is now the host of the Destroyer Hive, an insect hive that grows inside of his body and is home to thousands of demonic insects that are each afflicted with the Destroyer Plague. Despite his act of betrayal, and most of the Death Guard view Typhus' actions as something that, albeit unforgivable, is in the past. There's no point in dwelling on that which cannot change. Over the last 10,000 years, Typhus would deliver Nurgle's blessing to countless worlds. It is said that seven times seven times seven tallymen have dedicated their entire lives to counting the billions that have been slain in his wars. To this day, their tally has not caught up to the last 3,000 years of slaughter, and considering the tally of the dead increases every day, it is a never-ending pursuit. Though, despite this notion, those slain by Typhus in the Destroyer Hive do not stay dead for long, as they rise back up as one of many different strains of Plague Zombie that will then in turn spread Nurgle's blessings even further. At one point, Typhus was said to have turned every living soul within the overpopulated world of Jonah into one of these undead monstrosities, creating a shambling horde of the dead that stretched across continents. The most disturbing thing about Typhus to me, other than the grotesque body horror, is his utter fascination with the proliferation of disease. There's an interesting passage from the Dark Imperium trilogy, where one of the commanders within Ultramar is dragged before Typhus. He planned on giving the captured individual Nurgle's blessing, even though he knew uh, someone as stoic and rigid as an Imperial commander would surely die from the affliction before the pain induced by the disease would enlighten them. The profound revelation brought on by Grandfather's love was ultimately going to be wasted. Before he could do this, however, a demon who wished to speak with Typhus began to manifest through the captured man, twisting and contorting his body in all manner of terrifying ways, seemingly as if he had been inflicted with every disease at once. 
The hideous mutation and untold agony presented in front of Typhus elicited nothing less than sheer fascination. A glorious display of Nurgle's love, rather than a blasphemous and horrific act of plague-induced torture. Number 3. Urien Rakarth The individuals known as homunculi are said to be some of the most revered people within Dark Eldar society. They are wise and ancient monsters, geniuses of insane and unnatural technology, who command just as much fear as they do respect. Each and every one is a master flesh crafter that offers a wide range of disturbing services to any within their society that can afford them. These services come in all different forms, but most commonly, disturbing potions, poisons, and elixirs, body modifications, or all forms of esoteric weaponry that are designed to inflict as much pain and suffering as possible. The homunculi are the undisputed masters of pain, as they have dedicated their entire lives to its study. Each one of them is completely unique, and no two homunculi are exactly the same. Deep within the bowels of their grotesque laboratories, they conduct all manner of terrifying experiments on the still-living test subjects they have captured. These places are grim abattoirs filled with racks of gore-splattered torment slabs. Many of them are furnished with the stitched-together bodies of living slaves, complete with walls and floors made of living flesh. To enter into a contract with such a monster is no small feat, and the price can be incredibly high. That being said, as the homunculi have unlocked the secrets of life and death, and are able to regenerate any member of their species, no matter how catastrophic the damage, those who can afford it quickly become addicted to their services. Urien Rakarth was said to be the wisest, oldest, and most powerful of the homunculi. He is a wrinkled and unhealthy-looking ghoul that is said to have a completely depraved soul, one that has twisted and ripened over countless millennia filled with abhorrent practices. It is believed that he has lived since the fall of the Eldari and has been killed countless times. Each time he crosses the veil into the Immaterium, he gets another glimpse into the untold secrets of the universe, returning with a plethora of new profane knowledge with which to hone his craft. It's gotten to the point where he has died so many times that he actively looks forward to it, savoring each death like a fine wine. However, mysteriously, over the last several cycles of death and rebirth, his form has regrown with a piece of his old body still intact twisting in such a way that the outside now represents the true horror within his soul. He is covered in grotesque limbs, some having been weaponized through his experiments, while other vestigial ones beckon all those in his presence into his embrace. The rumors insist these newfound mutations are due to a flaw in his practice, but the truth is they are by his own design. The Mad Prophet looks at his own body in the same way he looks at all of his victims, as a canvas to conduct his sickening art upon. He is the undisputed master of flesh crafting, gene splicing, and the brewing of ever more disturbing poisons. Recently, Rakarth and the Prophets of Flesh have begun a grand mission to capture living space marines from every Primaris chapter. He's fascinated by the degradation of the Emperor's original gene crafting work over the millennia. For what dark purpose he seeks this information still remains unanswered. Number 2. Fabius Bile over the years, Fabius Bile has gone by many names. The Primogenitor, the Clone Father or Clone Lord, the Man Flare, and perhaps most famously, the Spider. A derogatory name the other Emperor's children called him due to the whirling system of mechanical limbs upon his back known as the Chirogen. Bile is a blight upon the galaxy, and one of the most deranged, nightmarish figures to have ever haunted the physical universe. He is a twisted yet ingenious molder of flesh, and sculptor of ever more nightmarish bio golems. And he literally wears a cloak of human skin if you needed any further indication of just how disturbed he is. Originally one of the Emperor's children's apothecaries during the Great Crusade, it was Bile's ingenious and disturbing personal search for perfection through surgical augmentation that gave rise to the many deranged upgrades that would come to infect the Legion. He did this through a complex web of terrifying surgeries and cocktails of synthesized chemicals that allowed each Legionary to experience sensations to ever more extreme heights. Yet despite his ever-increasing escalation of more ingenious creations, Bile never actually subjected himself to any of these procedures. Instead, every surgery, every new invention, every act of torture and dissection were simply stepping stones towards the mastery of life and death, a journey that would one day lead him to the dark city of Kimura, where he earned the prestigious honor of being the only human to ever study under the homunculi covens. Other than the skin cloak, I feel like the fact that the Dark Eldar took one look at this guy and were like, yep, I like the cut of his jib. 
should speak to the levels of depravity that old Fabulous Bill had sunk to. After the Horus Heresy, Fabius departed his legion and set off on his own to hone his craft, becoming a renegade amongst renegades. It is said that he moved through the Imperium like a shard of glass through an intestinal track, offering to sell his services and creations to any rebel warlords that could afford it. His payment would come in the form of prisoners, genetic samples, and ancient technology. He would eventually set up shop within the Eye of Terror on a fallen Eldari planet, wherein, over time, the world would become a flesh factorum of crawling madness. Many other renegade apothecaries from various traitor legions would come to this world in order to study under the Clone Father, thus building his reputation and power. It's kind of like a Doctors Without Borders thing, except way more horrifying. Any planet that has been blighted by the Clone Lord's presence can speak great volumes of his dark efficiency. He leaves a trail of twisted and grotesque abominations wherever he visits. All those that enter into a pact with him in order to procure his wares do so at great risk, as Bile has been known to demand entire Hive City's worth of slaves as price for his services. And even then, it's not unheard of for him to unleash the bioweapons and grotesque monstrosities the bargaining party had requested upon their population simply to observe their efficiency. Despite his untrustworthy nature, the other traitor legions greatly respect the efficiency of his creations, whether or not they respect the spider himself. This is a man who has such mastery over cloning that he was able to make clones of all of the Primarchs to various degrees, including his masterwork, a perfect clone of the Primarch Fulgrim, an entity that retained all of the original's memories, and, if the rumors are to be believed, a copy of the Primarch's soul as well. In recent years, Bile has become obsessed with his goal of replacing the human race with a new, even more perfect species of his own creation that he refers to as the New Men. He views the human race as flawed, a species that is ultimately destined for the halls of extinction. Thus, he has spread his creations throughout human society, and one day, they will rise up to overthrow them and replace humanity as the masters of the galaxy. Number 1. Conrad Kurz if you know anything about the Night Lords, you know that they are probably the most horrific of all Space Marine Legions. They are blood-crazed psychopaths that prey upon the weak, utilizing fear as their most potent weapon and striking at the enemy's most vulnerable positions. The Night Lords do not choose to engage their enemies in honorable combat on the front lines, instead striking behind their defenses to massacre civilians and destroy their points of industry. When these dudes would go to take a world, they would admittedly do it with less bloodshed or warfare than any other legion during the Great Crusade. But the way in which they did this was by torturing a small handful of individuals and then stringing up their corpses for the entire world to see. They would then project images of the grisly display across the entire system, sending the message loud and clear that if you didn't want this to happen to you and those you love, you would bend a knee to the Night Lords immediately. None embody their twisted philosophies more than their Primarch Conrad Kurz, a man who was constantly tormented by visions of the future. These visions imbued him with a profound sense of paranoia and a nihilistic outlook on the nature of humanity. He saw human beings as nothing more than livestock, beasts of burden that needed to be corralled into obedience through fear and pain. This is the philosophy he utilized to conquer his homeworld of Nostromo. When he was young, he adopted the title of Night Haunter and systematically butchered the criminals that plagued his gang-infested world. His reign of terror eventually forced the planet into compliance, and fear of the Night Haunter caused Nostromo's criminals to either go into hiding or repent their ways, lest the Night Haunter come for them. His philosophy of ruling through fear would eventually be proven to be a flawed one, as 10 years later, after his departure to lead the Night Lords during the Great Crusade, Nostromo would descend into its old habits, becoming a criminal's paradise once more. Before this, the youth that would be shipped from Nostromo to be inducted into the Night Lords' legions were from the noble families. Without the Night Hunter there to directly coax them into obedience, the new aspirants would instead be taken from Nostromo's prisons, Thugs, murderers, rapists, and gutter scum of all forms would funnel into the Legion, over time pushing the Night Lords to abandon any values they had left. Sickened by the infection of his Legion, and harboring no sentimental value for the world in which he was raised, Conrad returned with his fleets and bombarded Nostromo, shattering the planet and condemning all of its citizens to death. Kurz was a sick and depraved person who delighted in the suffering of others, mutilating and skinning his victims, sometimes as punishment for a perceived slight, but more often than not, just for fun. 
The throne room of his flagship resembled something more akin to a slaughterhouse. The floor, walls, and ceiling were all drenched in gore. His throne was surrounded by hundreds of chains and hooks hanging from the ceiling, upon which the bodies of his victims were placed, gently swaying back and forth. And if the accounts of the Primarch are to be believed, often whispering obscene prophecies to him. Later upon the world of Segualsa, he would construct a similar throne room known as the Screaming Gallery that took this concept to a far more disturbing level. And this is a passage from the Night Lord's Omnibus, where Talos, who at the time was a Night Lord's apothecary, witnessed the horrors on display. The first scene comes from the antechamber outside of the Screaming Gallery. The walls, like so much of the Legion's fortress, were formed from black stone, sculpted into forms of torment. Twist-backed humans arched and writhed motionlessly, captured at the moment of supreme agony. Their wide eyes and screaming mouths shaped by sadistic devotion. Shaped, not carved. Talos hesitated by the doors, his fingertips tracing over the open eyes of an infant girl, reaching for the protective, worthless embrace of an older man. Perhaps her father. Who had she been before the Legion raided her world? What had she done with her short life before she was dosed with paralytics and coated with rockcrete? What dreams were quenched by her living entombment within the hardening walls of a Primarch's inner sanctum? This is what Talos saw when he entered the Screaming Gallery itself. Talos walked down the central pathway, boots thumping on the black stone, while the floor either side of the walkway rippled and tensed with the pliancy of human expression. Eyes, noses, teeth, and tongues poking from open mouths. The ground itself was a carpet of faces, flesh crafted together, kept alive by grotesque Baroque blood filters and organ simulator engines beneath the floor. As an apothecary, Talos knew the machinery well. He was one of the few charged to maintain the foul ambience of the screaming gallery. Robed servitors, monotasked for the duty, sprayed gentle bursts of water vapor into the blinking eyes blanketing the floor keeping them moist. Conrad was so absolutely insane that his Primark novel, a series that, bear in mind, is designed to give the reader a deeper insight into a Primark as a character, i.e. their goals, motivations, history, and just about everything else that makes them tick. Conrad's Primark book is a straight-up horror story wherein a salvage crew picks up a stasis pod they find floating out in the void of space that contained the Night Haunter. They're not sure what to do with it, as it's clearly a space brain inside, but it's way too large. Conrad then proceeds to somehow break out of stasis and hunts down each member of the crew, one by one, slaughtering them in the most grotesque ways imaginable, and then stringing up their remains for the other members to find, taking a sickening delight on the torment he inflicts on all those within the ship. If you're a horror fan and a 40k fan, this is an absolutely must-read book and I really don't want to spoil it. It doesn't really give you a lot of deeper insights into his character other than he's fucking crazy, and I absolutely loved it. When I was ordering this list, it honestly came down to a tie between Fabius and Conrad. Urien Rackharth is incredibly disturbing, but he's also a Drukhari, and that's kind of par for the course for their entire species. Not that human beings aren't capable of great evil, as that's certainly true, but it's because we have a baseline to go with with humanity, as there are good humans out there who want to do the right thing. Seeing just how far these two characters have gone into their insanity, it kicks it up a notch on the creepy factor. For me, it really came down to their most recent novels. The Fabius Bile trilogy doesn't shy away from the fact that he is a monster, but it tries really hard to humanize him and makes you sympathize with the villain. That's not a knock against the series, it was incredible and remains as some of my favorite 40k books of all time. But with Conrad, it's the exact opposite. His Primark books sought to dehumanize him, even more than the considerably low levels he had already sunk to. He is a monster. There is nothing redeeming about him. You can sympathize with him that he is a tortured soul and had a rough upbringing, but that's about as far as it goes. He's not a character you're meant to understand. You're not meant to relate to him. That's not to say you can't love him as a character. I fucking love the Night Haunter. He's one of the most fascinating people in the entire setting to read about, but there's nothing relatable about him. He is fundamentally irredeemable. His story ends with him allowing himself to be assassinated to make a point. And since we have a beginning and an end for his story, he will never get a redemption arc. Every new piece that comes out about him, every new insight we get is simply designed to terrify the audience even more. 
And that's why, in my personal opinion, the number one spot could go to no one else. But what do you guys think? Do you agree, or is there somebody that creeps you out far more in 40K? Does 40K have the most terrifying characters, or is there somebody from a different franchise you think is way scarier? Was there somebody I didn't include on this list that you feel deserves to at least be mentioned? Let me know in the comment section down below, as I read just about everything y'all post, and I love hanging out and engaging with all of you. Also, if you haven't already, go ahead and like this video and subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell to be notified of future uploads. It only takes a second, it's free, and it seriously helps out my channel. Thanks again to everyone who supports the work that I do, and with that, I'll catch y'all in the next one.